Well, that wasn't your uh, usual kind of anthem today. <laughs> um, it was by the uh, British band Coldplay, uh, which is led by Chris Martin. And um, in an interview, he said that a sky full of stars is about when you just say to someone, whatever you do is awesome, and I love you no matter what. There's more, but I think that's the important part. And thanks to the choir, because I know that wasn't easy, and I appreciate you doing that for me. Well, let's go back to Corinth, where today's reading took place. In its day, Corinth was a destination city. It's a place where you would have planned your vacations. It was cosmopolitan. There were people from all over. It was a transportation hub, so if people were coming and going. There was lots of commerce and industry and lots of intellectuals and academics in town. Along with that, there were artists, musicians, actors, chefs, philosophers, scientists, civil servants, because it was also an important Roman uh, city, and full of Greeks as well. Now, Paul had stopped there early on in his missionary work. And he had tried to start a Christian community there. And it, it was a tough slog. But somehow, a small fragment of what became a church was formed. And then Paul carried on, and he went to Athens. And he got to Athens in the heartbed of, of intellectual life. And he got nowhere. And he realized that those poor folks in Corinth were having to put up with this sort of Athenian attitude towards the Christian faith. And he felt very badly for them, and so he wrote them a letter. And we have this early part of a letter today, where he owns up to the fact that, that the very symbol of our faith is preposterous. So we've got some videos, or uh, some pictures. Oops, next one. Okay. This is, is what most of us have grown up with, certainly in the United Church, as our cross, as the symbol of our faith. An empty cross, the cross of the resurrection. And we're so used to it, it's quite innocuous. Um, I even have crosses on my gown. These are Celtic crosses with the Celtic came, the, the blessing on them. Um, but let's have the next picture. When those people in Corinth were meeting with their neighbors and they said the cross was their symbol, that's what their neighbors saw. Because for them, the cross was a symbol of capital punishment. And, um, and it was a nasty thing. Or if we want to update it a little bit, let's see the next picture. That's a rather old version of the electric chair. Um, once again, Google is a wealth of images <laughs> for killing people. Um, but they're not pretty. We wouldn't put one of those on top of our church spire. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Oop. And if you watched um, Mel Gibson's Last Temptation of the Christ, this is the Christ you saw there and the cross. Um, messy, bloody, awful. Okay, now we'll go back to stars. There, and we're going to stick with that for now. So for people, rational learned people, people of the world, the cross was ridiculous. And Paul understood that. And so in this passage, he tries to help these folks contend with this discord in their lives, this absurdity that the very thing we believe in, the very symbol of our faith, is true against all the odds, against reason and proof and science. Now, I'll make an admission. You can probably tell by the gown. I'm a bit of an academic by nature. I love to read and study. I'm infinitely curious. And in the process of that, I, I like when things have a beginning and an end. So you complete a task. You know all there is to know about that thing. So when I was doing my, my doctorate um, in the early parts, I was... Um, given the, the whole prospectus for the program, and it included some projects. And one of the projects was in 
personal spirituality. So I went off to, to my apartment that I was staying in in Minneapolis and spent an evening designing this six-part evening course for my congregation in personal spirituality. And I had roughed up a questionnaire that they could take at the beginning and the end of these six weeks and then measure their spiritual growth. I thought that was pretty well done. So I marched into my advisor's office the next day and said, well, I got the outline for my spirituality project. And Lance looked down at it and almost instantly started shaking his head. He says, I, I, I don't think you've caught the drift of this, Sharon. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, actually, what we want you to do is to do a project to nurture your own spirituality. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. So he said, you need to find a spiritual director. And so I went off to St. Benedict's Priory, north of Winnipeg. And um, it's a marvelous, magical place. And I got a spiritual director. And uh, the first thing Sister Virginia did with me was help me understand Lectio Divina, the divine reading of scripture. You, you take a passage, maybe only a verse, and then you, you quietly reflect on it and then journal about it, your, your thoughts and feelings. So this was good. Each time I went, we would meet, have a little chat, then she'd give me my reading. And they would provide me with a little quiet room for contemplation. And I would then busily create the Encyclopedia Britannica journal on those verses. And at 3.30, at the end of the day, I would march down to Sister Virginia's office and hand them to her. I got the same reaction I got from Lance. Sort of. <laughs> Sister Virginia Evard is one of the most gracious people that has ever graced this earth. And she said ever so sweetly the next time, my dear, here is your scripture reading. I'd like you now to go for a walk. And the Priory grounds are right along the Red River, north of Winnipeg. And about three quarters of it is wooded. And they've cut paths through the woods. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So I, I took my passage and I read quietly in my room. And then I got up and I went for a walk. And uh, I was walking at a nice brisk pace thinking, okay, she said I'm to do this, and this is going to help my Nexio Divina, and, well, I'm burning calories. This is before the days of step counters, you know. But I, th I thought I was doing a good thing. And I was, I was in the woods, and there was just a small clearing, maybe, maybe four or five meters wide. And so I'm in the shade of the trees, and I step out into that clearing, and the sun beat on the side of my face. And it stopped me in my tracks. It took my breath away. Just boom. And then I walked on. And at 3.30, I went to meet with Virginia. And I said, the, the most amazing thing happened when I was out walking. And I told her. And she looked at me with a knowing smile and said, might that have been the spirit? Ooh. This, I think, is the moment when I came to terms with what the kind of dance I dance in life, where I have one foot in knowledge and reason and academics, and then the other foot in faith and promise and awe and wonder. What Virginia and Lance, in his way, did was push me, just as the kids know. God sometimes pushes you and pushes you through people to reclaim my capacity and for wonder and awe and, and the gift of wonder and awe in my life. What they were doing and what that moment of sunshine on my cheek did 
was help me reconcile this absurdity of the cross. The thing that makes no sense in one way and makes complete sense in another. And I was drawn to Psalm 19, which was assigned for today, and, and I hope you're okay with me telling it to the kids instead of having it read. It was an enthusiastic effort to explain what God is like. And of course, that's an impossible task. But you start understanding God by looking at the stars. Ancient people knew that. My dear friend Gladys Gray, who was a member of my first congregation and a, a, a dairy farmer, her husband worked in a white collar job somewhere else, and I will never forget the time we were visiting after I'd moved to Manitoba, and I was back there with my kids, and she was lying on the top of a hay wagon on the, the hay bale, lying, looking up to the sky with my kids, explaining clouds to them. They've never forgotten it. The psalmist understood. When you let yourself be dazzled, when you look at the sky, when you see its magnificence, you get a glimpse of God. So when I read Psalm 19 and this talk about stars, I was taken back. Um, a few years ago, I had purchased an adult study program to use in church. It was called Serious Answers to Hard Questions, which seemed like very good subject matter to deal with. And the host of the series was Dr. Francis Collins. Now, he's not quite a household name, but pretty close to it. He's the fellow that was the director at the beginning of the Human Genome Project at the National Institutes of Health in Washington. Just a phenomenal scientist. Phenomenal beyond imagining. And um, he grew up in a, as he said, a family of hippies who were hippies in the 40s and not in the 60s, and uh, it, who lived on a dirt farm in, in I, I think, West Virginia, and homeschooled him and had no faith. So he grew up, what he said, an atheist, and, and perhaps as he went through his training in chemistry and then biology and then medicine, um, except that he was becoming a bit of an agnostic until finally he would describe himself without hesitation as a Christian. Well, he, he went on to write two books. The first in 2006 called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence of Faith. And then five years later, The Language of Science and Faith, straight answers to genuine questions. And so what he concluded is that this journey of his through all of this scientific research and scientific acclaim, you know, he wasn't just studying, he was thriving. He said he was being led in the direction of awe. And when you think about the Big Bang, The Big Bang has a starting point, the start of the universe. And he said, but God isn't bound by time or space. And so before the Big Bang, there was God, because something had to make the Big Bang happen. So in that series of, a segment of, of studies, was one called Religion and Science. And it was hosted by Sir John Polkinghorne, the renowned Cambridge physicist, who in midlife, at around 51, I believe it was, went back and took a master's degree in divinity and was ordained an Anglican priest and went on to be uh, rector of St. George's College at Cambridge. He's a most interesting man. Either of these fellows, by the way, you can go onto YouTube and, and hear them lecture. They're absolutely fascinating. So John Polkinghorne's scientific argument for the existence of God can be said in one sentence. And it's the sentence that I have clung to 
that has provided me a new lens to experience life. He said, we are people of stardust made from the ashes of dead stars. Carbon. The only place you find it is in stars. And theoretically, chemists have posited how you can create a carbon atom, but they haven't been able to do it. So the chemistry of life, says Polkinghorne, carbon comes from God. He said only something wise, magnificent, and worthy of our awe could be, could be behind the beautiful, ordered universe that we have. Now we try to make our world an either or place, science or proof, science and proof or faith on the other side, as if they're inexorably incompatible. And, and that was the dilemma Paul faced in Corinth. The cross made no sense to non-believers. And yet it was the cross that Paul held out to them. It is the symbol of God who exists beyond the margins of science. This God of the cross is the God of the stars whom we encounter in awe and wonder. And I want to close with a story from someone, and you may have heard this story. Um, Marcus Borg, I know, was here for your first Lenten lectures in 2012. The last book he published, um, and I believe he finished it while he was battling cancer, um, came out in 2014, and it's called Convictions. And it is really him speaking from the heart about what he believes or believed and why he believed it. But he tells this magnificent story. He's in northern Minnesota. This is about 40 years ago now. In a two-seater MGB in the wintertime. And he's driving along one of those long, straight Minnesota roads. There is nothing happening. That time of the year, the cows aren't even out in the fields. And as he's driving along, all of a sudden, the sky turns a yellow-golden color. Just completely enveloping yellow-golden. And he said of this experience, everything glowed. Everything looked wondrous. I was amazed. And I became aware not just intellectually, but experientially of the connections of everything. That experience lasted maybe a minute and then faded, but it was the richest minute of my life. It was not only full of wonder, but also with a strong sense of knowing, seeing more clearly and truly than I ever had. We are people of the cross, and we are stardust. Thanks be to God.